Hey, good morning, fellow disciples. I am super excited to be hanging out with you. Uh, we've been going through a series on spiritual disciplines, and honestly, uh, it's been an incredible series. I've heard a lot of feedback, a lot of people enjoying this series and saying, hey, why didn't we have this conversation before? For those of you who are just joining us in this video, what is a spiritual discipline? Spiritual disciplines are actions that we do on our own, but don't actually do anything. What they do is they place our soul in a position where God, through his Holy Spirit, can change and transform us from the inside out, okay? That being said, this is why we do spiritual disciplines. We learn from Jesus, what does it look like to live in the kingdom? Through the example that he gave, it's not just about his birth and his death and resurrection, it's also about his life. He lived a life that literally physically showed us how do we live within the kingdom. So we glean from his teachings as we become disciples, as we choose Jesus to be the ruler of our lives. If you haven't made that decision yet, today would be a fantastic day to make that decision. And no, it's not just fire insurance. It's not just about getting out of hell. The gospel is here to create a human soul into wholeness, into peace, into shalom, into the likeness of what we should be from the beginning. And that is the likeness of Jesus, right? How do we do that? We give our hearts to him. We surrender ourselves to him. And this spiritual discipline of today, you talk about humility. It's going to be a, a huge step for you and for me because we are going to have to humble ourselves to say, I'm willing to follow Jesus in, in this spiritual discipline. So which one are we talking about this time, right? We're talking about simplicity, all right? <laughs> now, you probably think simplicity. You're like, oh, I've, I've heard about that. There's some books that use the word simple on it, okay? Um, but that's not necessarily related to what we're talking about today. Instead, I, I will say that the subject of simplicity, I'm so sorry to say this, folks, but we either never talk about it within churches or it's never heard of in churches. And there's multiple reasons why. Um, the main one being that nobody likes to be told what to do. Okay, let's be honest. We don't like anyone disrupting our lives, which is funny because if Jesus is Lord in charge of our lives, then he has a right to disrupt them or rearrange the furniture if you wanted to of our lives, if that makes sense to you. Um, that's why he's called Lord. He's in charge, right? So as I say that, there's just very, very, very slim and very few people that actually teach on the spiritual discipline of simplicity and actually teach what you find within scripture. Now, you probably want to pause right now and say, okay, Pastor Johnny, let's be real and let's be honest. Um, I've read my Bible uh, I've never heard of the word simplicity or simple in the Bible in, in the sense that you're talking about it. You have. The subject is in there. The word itself, probably not. What do I mean by simplicity then? Well, simplicity is an inward reality and an outward reality, which we will jump into what exactly it is. But we will deal with why do we have the spiritual of simplicity to begin with. First off, it's been around since the beginning of time. And again, once we understand what it means, you're like, oh, I get it. But recently within the last hundred years, we've had a language issue. Let me explain what I mean by that. Language drives our understanding of reality, okay? Um, that being said, once upon a time, we had this English word called priority. What is a priority? You're right. Uh, assuming that I can hear you through this thing, which I can't, but you probably said something that's important. Yes. Way to go. Okay. Now that we understand that a priority is something that's important, somewhere within the last hundred years, let's say even last 50 years, someone decided to create probably because they wanted people to produce more um, goods or services. They decided to create a singular word, priority, meaning number one or important. By the way, it would normally be followed by number two, number three, number four, and they're less important as they go down. Someone decided to grab the language of priority and make it plural. Priorities. Let me tell you why that's a problem. When we say the word priorities, based upon the definition that we just discussed, are you telling me that there's multiple number ones? Yes. Which may mean that there's multiple number twos and number threes and number fours. That's a whole nother issue in and of itself. How can we have multiple number ones, though? How can we say these are things that are important? Well, what's more important than the other? No, no, no. They're all important. 
Ooh, so see, that is the destruction of simplicity. In fact, we have now given birth to what has fractured the human soul, otherwise known as duplicity. Duplicity means I am multitasking to the nth degree because I have all of these goals, these number ones, these priorities that I'm trying to reach and I'm trying to complete. This is kind of where we get the phrase, I am a jack of all trades and the master of none. I can't be the master of all of them because there's all of them that I have to practice and somehow figure out how to do them probably half good, half well, but at least I can do them. Folks, the reason why we have so much anxiety within the church today, and this can be applied even to those outside the church, the reason why we have so much of this anxiety is because of duplicity. We have multiple number ones. And we run ourselves crazy trying to figure out how to do all this. Let me bring it to you from, from another perspective. If I can quote uh, uh, an incredible man by the name of Fran Francois Fenello, if I said that right. When we are truly in the interior simplicity, our whole appearance is franker, more natural. This is true simplicity. Make us, it makes us conscious of a certain openness, gentleness, innocence, gaiety, and serenity, which is charming when we see it near to and continually with pure eyes. Oh, how amiable this simplicity is. Who will give it to me? I leave all for this. It is the pearl of the gospel. What is simplicity? Simplicity is focusing on the one thing, the only thing that actually matters. But as I explained to you guys, it's an interior reality that will always work itself into an outward action. That's what simplicity will always do. When we focus only on the outward action of simplicity, it becomes a religious law, which will always result in death. When we focus only on the interior, the, in, the inward reality of simplicity, not the exterior, well, now we're just lying to ourselves. So we have to understand it's two things happening on at the same time, okay? Simplicity is freedom. Duplicity is bondage. When we have multiple number ones that we're trying to take care of. We will find ourselves feeling exhausted, anxious, um, we don't know where where our focus needs to be. It's just in multiple things at once. And at the same time, we feel like I'm going nowhere and getting nothing done. That's correct. Duplicity is what we're trying to avoid and simplicity is what we're trying to adopt. Okay, Pastor Johnny, hold on. Where in the Bible is simplicity actually found? Because I'm a little confused. Well, simplicity is actually found everywhere in Scripture. The word simplicity may not be found. But the idea of simplicity is everywhere. And in fact, Jesus spoke so much about simplicity that it's, it's really shocking that we don't talk more about it within our churches. What do you mean by simplicity? Again, simplicity is there's only one thing that we are focusing on inwardly. And then outwardly, what does that look like? Is, again, it's only one thing that we're focusing on. Where is it in the Bible? Uh, and this is where we're going to get a little uncomfortable, and I'll tell you why. Nobody likes to be told what to do, right? More specifically, let me show you where we do not like anyone to tell us what to do. Right here. Now, I know you're probably impressed. It's a Doctor Who wallet. That's not why I'm showing it to you. Our money, our finances. To put it a different way, our circle of influence, as, as um, Dallas Willard once put it. Now, you're probably thinking, okay, fine, I know this is coming. Churches are always talking about money. No, I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to tell you where to give, how to give, how much to give, and to plant a seed. No, let's not do that. That's silly and dumb. Rather, what I'm saying is, as we follow Jesus, we learn that Jesus actually talked about the economics of the human soul. He constantly would say, listen, what you prioritize... That is your treasure. If I can find where that thing is, I will find your heart there. If you guys remember him teaching where the treasure is there, the heart will be also. 
What Jesus was getting at is, are you going to run after the multiple things that are important or number one's priorities? Or is there some one thing that we are called to not only focus on, but also execute within our lives? Yes, that is the subject of simplicity. Again, if we focus only on duplicity, we will run ourselves crazy. If we focus on simplicity, we will actually find freedom. Ecclesiastes tells us that the human soul was created for one thing, right? Let, let me read that to you, okay? So according to Ecclesiastes 7.30, God made man to be simple. Now you're like, I'm offended. No, I'm not that kind of simple. I mean, he never created us to have a complicated life. He created us for him. That's simplicity. We were made for him and he wants to be part of our lives. He is also asking us to ask God, be part of me as well. Be part of my life. Be part of the relationship. Do you kind of get the idea where we're going with this? Okay. There are many people out there. Um, I showed you my wallet because they, a lot of the times we have bought into this culture. That is a terrible culture. And it's the culture that says, listen, I need to possess things. I need to have things. I am defined by the things that I have. And when I don't have, um, it makes me feel inferior. And then when you break it down, here we are, you know, what we call the whole, catch, you know, catching up with the Joneses or whatever. You know, they have a bigger car. We want a bigger car. They have a van. We need a van. They have two kids. We need to have two kids. We need a... And there's this constant, like, you know what I'm saying? There's, there's, I need this, I need that. And then you talk about your workspace and it's the, this person's being promoted. I need to be promoted. And I'm the, and there's this covetousness, there's this coveting and there's this lust of, I want power. I want fame. Don't even get me started with online presence. It be, even churches have bought into to this horrific lie that we need to be the biggest online presence. We need to be hip. We need to be, you know, putting things out there. We need to put good content. We need to, you know, and on and on. But then it becomes, if you're listening to my voice going like, slow down, that's exactly what I mean. The anxiety goes through the roof. Can I say a phrase from an author by the name of Richard Foster that is going to drive you insane? This I pray that this gets so glued to your soul that it will help you as you follow Jesus. You ready for this one? We live in a culture that makes you buy things to impress people you don't like. How dumb do we feel now? We hoard, we clutter, we, I have to go to the best restaurant. I have to uh, have the best, you know, X, Y, Z for my kids, or I have to send my kids to this school because every other parent here is saying that they are part of, I have to be part of these meetings. I have to be the lead pastor. I have to be, you know, uh, this kind of car, this kind of house. I need, I need, I need, I need. <sighs> Breathe. Can we have a conversation about this? Okay. You don't own anything. I don't own anything. This is why simplicity is everywhere in the Bible. Let's take a little adventure all the way into the Old Testament. Let's go to Leviticus. How about there? I mean, it starts from the beginning. But if we go to Leviticus chapter 25, verse 23, whom does the world belong to? The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. So what do I own? Nothing. I don't even own myself. The earth is the Lord's and everything within Psalm 62.10 says, do not worry about the investments and the, I'm looking at the stock market. And the, and the, last time I checked, God takes care of you. He's the one that has the, the cattle on a thousand hills. He's the one that possesses everything and he loves his children deeply. What about Proverbs 11.28? Some of us are like, I want a million dollars. I would love to be buried in dollar bills. Did you know that being buried in money is still a coffin? What about Matthew 6 verses 19 through 21? What does Jesus say? When I come hunting for what matters to you, what is your treasure? 
It's interesting, wherever that is, I will find your heart there also. Your focus and your desire will be on the things, things that you hold most important. So from the beginning to the end of your Bible, it talks about simplicity. Our priorities shouldn't be the things that we possess. It shouldn't be our status. Oh, man, can this sermon preach itself? How many likes do you need before you begin to feel validated? That, by the way, is never satisfied. I wonder why. Because of duplicity. Simplicity says there's only one thing that matters. There's only one person that matters. There's only one kingdom that matters. Can I read something to you? This will kind of help us understand fully what I'm talking about. In Matthew 6, verse 25. So we're just going to go straight to Jesus on this one. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Huh. Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wild flowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into a furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Pause and listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you, because this is the definition of simplicity. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, don't worry about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble in of its own. What is simplicity? Simplicity is seeking first the kingdom of God. What I love is simplicity can quickly become a death trap only if we focus on the exterior side of it. Meaning, if we establish laws that say, all right, church, here's what we're going to do. We're going to live simply. We're going to get rid of cars. We're going to get rid of bank accounts. We're going to get rid of this. We're going to get rid of the Whoa, whoa, whoa. No, no, no. Every person has to do one thing and only one thing. First, seek the kingdom. Okay, so this guy, incredible theologian, uh, Soren Kierkegaard, and I probably butchered his name, but look him up. He's incredible. He said this when he was asked about the discipline of simplicity. Let me read this to you. Should a person get a suitable job in order to exert a virtuous influence? His answer, no. We must first seek the kingdom. Then, should we, all, should we give away all our money to feed the poor? Again, the answer, no. We must first seek God's kingdom. Well, then perhaps we are to go out and, and, and preach this truth to the world that people are to seek first God's kingdom? Once again, the answer is a resounding no. We are first to seek God's kingdom. He concludes, Then, in a certain sense, it is nothing I shall do. Yes, certainly, in a certain sense, it is nothing becoming nothing before God. Learn to keep silent. In this silence is the beginning, which is first to seek God's kingdom. When we try to force this upon everyone, then we've already lost the purpose of it. Our heart, inwardly and outwardly, 
should be that there are no priorities. It is a priority, one. And that one is to seek the kingdom first, before anything. Folks, when we focus on that, our demeanor is going to change. Our personality is going to change. Our anxiety is going to disappear. Why? Because we're not anxious about anything. I don't care what my status is. I don't care what my reputation is. I don't care that I have the latest and greatest. I don't care what title I have. I don't care whether I'm getting stuff done or I'm not getting stuff done. Why? Because the only thing that matters is the kingdom of God. I'm, I'm running to the Father going, hey, Father, I'm just, I'm just here to be with you. I'm here to do whatever it is you ask of me. If you ask anything of me. And I, I want to do whatever the heart of God wants to do. And how that plays out, man, it's just going to be beautiful. But I don't have any agendas. I don't have any priorities. It's just him. And where will this inf where will this bleed out? It'll bleed out in our wallet, first and foremost. It's going to cause us to say, I don't need to buy that. I don't need to invest in. I don't need to. Now, let, let, pump the brakes. Let me make something very, very clear. Does God want to take care of us? Yes. Did you not read the text? When we read what Jesus said, he goes, listen, listen, look at the fields. Look at the flowers. Today they're here. Tomorrow they're burning. Aren't you more important than them? He said, look at the birds. They don't sit there and like, hurry, guys. We got to put things together, build a barn, stack it in, you know, make sure. He goes, no, he feeds them all the time. I, I, I think you're worth more than them, right? Right? Is that? By the way, Jesus is very sarcastic. I want to catch on to that. What he's saying is, listen, you, you don't understand your own value here, kiddo. That's why you focus on what am I going to eat? What am I going to wear? What am I going to like? What's my status? What's my power? What's my my influence? Like, you know, what kind of persona am I showing? Oh, shut up. And I say that with all due respect. Stop. Can you imagine what our churches would be like if celebrity pastors knocked it off? Stop, man. Can I give you some applicable stuff to walk out with? We need to have a plan. So what does simplicity look like? Number one. Thank you for that. <laughs> First seek the kingdom. Okay. First seek the kingdom. And listen carefully to what Jesus tells you. Jesus, how can I live a simple life that honors you and your kingdom? Here are some suggestions. I'm trying to get that word out there. To help you understand how to live the simple life. Okay. Number one, buy for usefulness, not for status. Hey man, the iPhone 14 is crazy. Did you know that the iPhone 6 does the same thing? The iPhone 10, the iPhone 11, 12, 13. You get what I'm saying? Who are you trying to, to show off to? <laughs> Stop. Your phone works great. Use it. Your watch works great. Use it. When it dies, then go get a new one. But you don't need it. You, no one needs to show off and see. We buy for functionality. Number two, reject anything that produces an addiction in you. Yeah. If, if you're like, listen, I got 15 sneakers and, and 15 pairs. And I can't wait for the new Jordans to come out. Do you, do you have 15 pairs of feet? No. So don't, don't buy things out of an addictive behavior or that cause an addiction in you. That might include any sort of substance abuse or anything like that, okay? Number three, develop a habit of giving things away. One of the things that I didn't cover earlier that, I, that now I'm remembering, simplicity will teach us something really cool. One, everything that you receive is from God. Remember I was telling you that God is in charge of everything. He owns the entire planet. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's again, according to Leviticus, right? He owns the entire planet. So everything that he gives you, you say, thank you, God. Thank you, God, for whatever he hands you, okay? Uh, every blessing. Thank you, God. Secondly, if God gave it to you, then he's going to maintain it. Thirdly, if God gave it to you and he's going to maintain it, he's probably going to give you enough that you can give it away. So in the end... You don't possess anything. You are 
a steward of whatever God has given you. God, if you've given me X, Y, Z, and you're maintaining X, Y, Z, then that means I can give away X, Y, Z, because if I needed more, then you'll just give me more. Do you see where this is going? I don't know whether I covered the, the, the <laughs> but anyway, if you guys want, I want you, I'm going to throw some biblical references at you, and I want you to understand we don't own anything here, okay? Uh, check out Leviticus 25, 23. Check out Psalm 62, 10. Check out Proverbs 11, 28. And check out Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 21. Simplicity is everywhere in the Bible. God owns everything. It's not our job to possess anything or be possessed by anything. Rather, it is our job just to seek his kingdom. He is going to fill in everything else that we need. So that was number three. Develop the, the, the habit of giving things away. It's okay. Give it away. It's fine. Uh, number four, refuse to be uh, propagandized by the custodians of modern technology. It's like, oh, you got the you got the the new you know Apple Watch. Ooh, but we got a newer one. Come on, like you know, it does this and it does the other. It does it? And I know I I pick on Apple, but there's tons of things out there. That did you you know your new car? Is it this year's car or is it two years ago car? You know, did you did you buy the right kind? Did you have? Don't buy into them. Just go. Thank you. No, thank you. I, Okay, because we buy for functionality. Don't give in to technology. The last thing's always going to break. The new one's always got to be taking its place. Number five, learn to enjoy things without owning them. You could probably learn this from your grandparents because they love to grab grandchildren, feed them candy, and then hand them back. <laughs> for ser Seriously, though, like, you don't have to own it. Enjoy it. Enjoy, learn to enjoy things, and then this isn't mine, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, number six, develop a deeper appreciation for the creation. In other words, go outside. Stop looking at the screen. Stop looking at your phone. Look up. Do you realize all that God has given you just because? You learn to appreciate it because it's him again. This is his love letter to you. Look at creation. I love you. Enjoy it. I made you for it. Number seven, look with a healthy skepticism with the buy now, pay later. It, it's not going to work. I know some things we have to. We, we need a car. We need a house. We're technically buy now, paying later. But whenever somebody goes, hey, we could really, you know, you can invest in, you could. You don't need it. Let it be. Okay. Number eight. Obey Jesus' command on simple, honest speech. If you guys look uh, through Matthew chapter 5, at the end of chapter 5, he says, let your yes mean yes and no mean no. Uh, you don't have to swear by anything. Oh, I promise. I swear to God. I swear on my mother's... Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> no. no. Just be the kind of honorable person that when you say yes, people know that you mean it. And when you say no, it's the... I. Sorry, there are, are things that are important to me, and this is unfortunately not one of them. Uh, and I can't, or I won't. That's fine. Let your yes mean yes, no mean no. Uh, number nine, reject anything that breeds the oppression of others. Maybe you love XYZ kind of car, but you find out that there are people on the other side of the world that are dying to make this product for you. Uh, then, no, I'm not going to perpetuate the death or harm or the oppression of, of um, um, what's the word? poverty there you go an oppressive poverty in another part of the world just so i could have this item like nope no thanks i will not participate in that okay because that's not what the kingdom's about we don't oppress others just for our own good number 10 shun whatever distracts you from first seeking the kingdom whatever is stopping you from seeking can i tell you something i know this is going to hurt but people who don't seek the kingdom of God first actually don't seek the kingdom at all. Be real and be honest. They don't. In the words of my old pastor, uh, whether he watches this or not, his name is Daryl Ward. Love the man. Taught me a lot. Um, incredible man of God. He always said this phrase. In the light of eternity, what does it matter? 
if we could learn to repeat that to ourselves, we're in good company. In the light of eternity, what does this really matter? Grace and peace be with you. Today is a day that we get to follow Jesus. Let's do it. This is the way. You guys have a good one.